So here was your scenario. There was a 64 year old female found in the middle of a shopping center. So you were called there because uh, a retail worker contacted security, security called 911 after they found this female they believe to be intoxicated just based on her behavior. So she appears very emotionally distraught um, and just kind of seems like she's having a hard time completing all of her sentences or really putting together a full thought. When you ask her what's going on, she clearly replies, the truck yard mower. And then after that, she just kind of seems you know, distraught that she can't put those thoughts together. Her skin is pink, warm, dry. Her pupils were normal, reactive to light, and the physical assessment is unremarkable. So while you're doing that assessment, your partner obtains the vital signs of a BP of 138 or 62, a heart rate of 76, pulse oximetry was 96% on room air, and blood glucose was 86 or 4.7. So really, all those vital signs, nothing crazy sticks out. So you were asked, what is your differential diagnosis? And how would you describe this patient's speech? So let's get into talking more about strokes, because this presentation leads out to a patient having a stroke that is not presenting in the typical things of the hemoplegia, or the facial palsy, you know, the asymmetric smile, that different things can build up into strokes that don't always present as normal. So we have two types of strokes. There is ischemic stroke, meaning that the blood vessel is either blocked or it's become narrowed to where blood cannot pass through a certain spot, or if it does pass through, it's not enough to adequately perfuse that tissue distal to that site. So maybe there is a clot that's completely blocked that blood flow causing that part of the brain to become ischemic and ultimately infarct. Then there is hemorrhagic stroke. That is the vessels within the brain, surrounding the brain, intrabrain, that have rupture causing a hemorrhage. So that'd be that hemorrhagic stroke causing that brain bleed. Now, in pre-hospital, there's no real way for us to differentiate between those two. But some symptoms we might see between those could be paresthesia, meaning that pins and needles sensation to where you know, they might say, well, I can't feel the side of my face or it's just kind of numb. Okay, so that numbing or complete absence of sensation. Then hemoplegia, you know, the brain's divided between a right and left hemisphere, meaning that hemi. So that is the right or the left side of the body loses its ability to have motor function. So they are basically partially or completely paralyzed on the right or the left side of the body. And then there's aphasia or aphasia. Okay, they kind of sound the same, but they are different. Okay, aphasia or dysphasia. Okay, so those can be used kind of interchangeably between the A or the dis. A generally meaning the absence of or dis meaning the difficulty thereof. So uh, with an S, that relates to speech. So aphasia could mean that they are, just do not have the ability to make words, whereas dysphasia might mean that they have difficulty making words, or if they have dysphasia, meaning that you know, maybe they are saying words, but it is the, or you know, it just kind of sounds slurred, whereas aphasia might mean that they can make words, but they're the wrong words. Whereas with a G, that means swallowing. Okay, so in my mind, S deals with speech, G deals with a gag reflex. So aphasia or dysphasia deal with the, um, the inability or difficulty with swallowing. Okay, so the fear we have there is if they experience that and they've lost their gag reflex is we could potentially have airway compromise. And then ultimately the classic things like confusion, that they are not alert and oriented to person, place, time, or event that is deviated beyond their baseline. And then weakness. Maybe it's not that complete hemoplegia. Maybe that they just have some more progressive weakness to one side of the body to the other, that they can still move it, but just not as well as the other side. And then a headache. Some may have a headache, some may not. It just depends. So even if it's hemorrhagic or ischemic, they may or may not present with that headache. And then visual disturbances. Not that you know they're seeing creatures or weird stuff like that, but they 
um, maybe they're very photosensitive that the light really hurts their eyes or they see you know flashes of light or they just see you know f various floaters of things or you know really anything that's disrupting their vision maybe it's become blurred all of a sudden and then conjugate deviation that means that the eyes can become fixed that they don't have the ability to look straight that they might just be permanently fixed one way or the other now the brain is divided up into multiple lobes and those different lobes are responsible for controlling different parts uh, or different actions within the body so depending on where that stroke actually occurs in a brain is going to determine how they present okay so if we think about bad 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 strokes okay well really no stroke is good but think about a brain stem so the big you know involuntary things in our body you know our heart beating our breathing and our blood pressure are all controlled within that brain stem so if there could be a stroke within our brain stem that could just be instantaneous death whereas if we think about maybe something in the frontal lobe as we see here that might be just dealing with uh, motor control or problem solving or speech production so that patient having that aphasia or dysphagia could be having a frontal lobe stroke so maybe they're just a little unsteady on their feet and they just can't critically think about things okay that can also kind of mimic somebody having a really bad migraine so if you think about your person who's had migraines of just how you have that brain fog and it's just hard for your brain to process things those patients having a frontal lobe stroke can present the same way now we start getting into the cerebellum that's where they have really bad balance or coordination or they have that uh, a static gait to where they just want to fade to one side or the other um, if it's in that occipital lobe in the back that can be their major vision issues okay so we can look at those lobes and what the responsibilities are so depending on where that stroke is or how big it is you know maybe that stroke has involved multiple lobes and then it starts getting into um, you know imagine a stroke that involves the temporal lobe the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe of how many things that that could pro or could involve could disrupt in their you know their normal well-being and we go by uh, a standard assessment okay we've all probably heard of the fast assessment okay the face do they have that arm drift or i'm sorry the facial droopage can they smile so we're looking for that symmetric smile but if they don't have it and they just one side comes up that's an indicator of a stroke or arms are they able to hold their arms up or do one does one come up and you'll start to drift or does only maybe one come up okay so that can be the difference of that weakness or that hemoplegia to where you hold arms up and one just drops and then speech are they is it slurred do they have that aphasia where they're just saying the inappropriate words or does it just sound uh unrecognizable that you can't understand any of their words and then we go by time okay so there's different things you might see out there with fast of t for time or t for tongue because depending on where that again that stroke is it can cause that tongue to deviate but that's a pretty uncommon sign to see that tongue deviation so a lot of the things now as you see this snippets put out by the stroke foundation and they went away from the tongue it's just time time is critical and so to be calling you know 911 or triple zero wherever your place is but again it's a picture that i borrowed this is one that i came up with several years ago i like to go by the the mnemonic of go fast okay because we know that strokes are time sensitive so utilizing that mnemonic of go fast is very beneficial all right so we need to know a glucose because hypoglycemia or diabetic complications can mimic stroke and we want to know the onset when was their last known normal and then we're looking kind of more more standard of fast we're looking for the facial drooping we're looking at arm drift can they hold their arms up or does one drift and fall what's their speech like are they confused are the words inappropriate or do the words are they uh, you know incomprehensible are they really just slurring the words having a difficult time to get them out and then we consider time yeah we know that we're not trying to call 911 or emergency services because that's us so time is that consideration of from the onset to 
you know, treatment, are we able to go by ground? Does that require air medical? Because time is not in our favor with stroke. So do we have the ability to ground pound it, as we'll say, or should we consider alternative uh, transportation such as air medical? Another one that is out is the MEND exam. Okay, this is from the Miami Emergency Neurological Deficit. Now, this is one that like a lot of people are doing or doing partial of, whether they really know it or not. Okay, so we're looking at mental status. Are they um, any, and again, anything in here that's abnormal is the more things that are abnormal is the higher indication of a large vessel, a large vessel occlusion meaning that it is a substantial stroke that warrants immediate emergent interventions. Okay, so what's their mental status like? Are they um, unresponsive? Do they have any type of altered mental status? Then we look at speech. We make them say something or have a conversation with them, such as you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, don't worry about the tongue twisters of, you know, what beavers do or this or that. So we're not after tongue twisters. Just give them a simple phrase that is common and ask them to repeat it and see what their speech sounds like. And then we, you know, kind of asking that along with their level of consciousness, are they oriented? So asking them, you know, how old they are, what the month is, you know, maybe what the most recent holiday was. You know, so if some people have some, you know, advanced cognitive decline, they may not know what month it is, but they might be able to relate to what holiday was recent or maybe what season that we are in. And then do they have the ability to follow commands? You know, close your eyes, open your eyes, stick out your hands, raise your hands. And then we're looking for cranial nerve assessments. We're looking for that facial droop, big smile. Show your teeth, looking for that symmetry up one side or the other. The only thing abnormal is if we have that droop or only one side comes up. And then we look for visual fields, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's. Are their eyes able to go in all these visual fields? Can they see out the side? You have them stare here. Can they see this? Can they see this? Or maybe they're only able to see this and you do this and they don't see anything. So we're testing that lateral and the narrowed fields. And then with limbs, Doing the, you know, the arm drift thing. Close your eyes, hold out your hands. Are you able to hold it up to a count of 10? Then we'll kind of do the same thing with the legs too. Are they able to hold their legs up? Okay. Um, touching. So we'll have them close their eyes, touch a face, touch the legs, touch the arms, and see if they're able to feel and identify what we are touching. And then there's coordination. Okay, so this is one that like a lot of us will see in hospital, but maybe at this point is one we're not really doing in the ambulance due to them being, you know, seat belted and whatnot. Um, but doing this kind of coordinations of finger to nose, finger to nose, and then on the legs, take their heel. So if this is the legs, take the heel, put it on the shin, drag it up this shin, put this heel on this shin and drag it up the shin. That's one that's a little bit harder for us to do in an ambulance while we're in transport. Okay, because real quick ones, we're looking for the fast. Do we see any you know, changes in mental status, uh, arm drift, facial drooping, speech, so on. And then the LA pre-hospital stroke scene, the LAPSS. So a lot of it is kind of on the same thing, but a couple other tweaks, um, like of screening criteria mostly, like what's their age, you know, over 45 years, more likely to be having a stroke than a 20 year old. Do they have any history of seizures or epilepsy? Yeah, maybe this, their presentation, they are actually postictal. Um, what symptoms have they had in the last 24 hours? You know, could it be something other like diabetes, UTI, something that is causing that altered mental status per se? Um, are they wheelchair bound? What's their blood glucose? Look for obvious asymmetry to their body one side or the other. And then the LA scale is one that's put in here that a lot of us are doing that we're kind of making these hybrid versions. Like we kind of do maybe the Cincinnati, then ask them to do equal grips. Well, the grip is part of the LA stroke scale. Okay. And then arm strength, you know, the drifting and whatnot. And then um, we kind of do the, you know, yes or no criteria based on this exam. Do they have unilateral or bilateral weakness? And again, all these things are the more things we're checking yes or abnormal is the more indicators towards a large vessel occlusion. 
Okay, so this is one from that is fast DD, the field assessment stroke triage for emergency destination. So if we start doing all of these scores, right? So the facial palsy, are they, you know, can they move both sides equally or not? Then we're doing the arms and we're doing the speech and then cognition. Can they follow commands? And then we're checking the eyes again, cross the T's, dot the I's. Okay, so we're looking for those pupils, pupils equal round reactive to light with accommodation. When we bring the finger in, cross the T's, do their eyes follow and cross. Okay, so generally anything with this that's scored more than four is highly indicative of a large vessel occlusion. So, you know, which warrants going to co comprehensive stroke skin, comprehensive, that's a tongue twister, comprehensive stroke center that can handle these large vessel occlusions. And ultimately the treatment, what are we going to do for these stroke patients? Well, we need to maintain, you know, adequate pulse oximetry. So over 94%, if their oxygen saturations are above that and they're not having difficulty in breathing, oxygen is contraindicated because their brain is already hyperperfused and the physiological understanding is if we give oxygen, it gets rid of excess CO2 and that actually causes a little bit of vasoconstriction. So imagine that ischemic patient already has that narrowed passageway and now we give them a bunch of oxygen and we close it off even more. Okay, so that free radicalization is a thing as well. So as long as they are oxygenating well, their pulse oximetry is good, we don't need to give them oxygen. Now, if they're having airway compromise and are short of breath, yes, then we need to give them oxygen. And otherwise, we're basically gonna be treating any other symptoms that we see. Okay, so, and then assessments. Assessments is a big thing, try not to miss um, any small cue or assessment that could make us suspect a stroke. Big things, last known normal. What is their baseline? Because remember that something abnormal is very subjective. So what might seem abnormal to us might actually be the patient's normal. So we need to understand how they are deviated from their baseline. Also, are they on any blood thinners in case it is a hemorrhagic? Um, and if they are only blood thinners, what that name is. Because different blood thinners, if they need to give medications, different medications interact differently with blood thinners, or if they need to try to reverse it, it just kind of depends on what the medication is to allow them to treat appropriately at the Comprehensive Stroke Center.